Well, we are, have been working on the series on Genesis, okay, and it's an important series of covering different themes and topics, and we're coming soon to the end of Genesis. But I decided to take a back step to look at Genesis chapters 18 and 19 in the light of what has happened around the world. You and I are very aware of the U.S. Supreme Court judgment recently handing down this whole issue about gay marriage, isn't it? And it's been happening in many, many nations around the Western world, and no less, friends, in this part of the world as well. This is really a hot and a raging topic. And I felt that it is needful, therefore, for you and I as God's people here in UMC, possibly the first time in any church in Malaysia, to deal with this subject hate on, the LBGTs. And I felt this morning, this weekend, is a time really for you and I to come to confront this and what the Bible has to say to all of us. I know it is a very sensitive subject. I want to deal with it as clearly as I can, as firmly as I can, and as biblically as I can. But I also want to deal with it sensitively and compassionately. And therefore, friends, you know, I ask you to pray with me, all right, as we soon launch into this subject. Can you good amen for that? We're going to stand to read this passage of Scripture that is connected to what I'm going to say this morning. Genesis chapter 18 and 19. And so as the thing is projected on the screen, sorry, our center screen this morning is not working. So that's the reason why many of us who are used to looking right in the middle of the huge screen is not working this morning. And so therefore, we're going to read from Genesis chapter 18, verses 16 to 21, and then after the chapter 19, uh, verses 1 to 13. To get a church, because this is a pattern here at UMC, we honor God's word as we read God's word in standing. Amen, isn't it? To get a church. When the man got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he would direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin so grievous, that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got out to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go, go on your way in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast. And they ate before they had gone to bed. All the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. And they said, This fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We will treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old with blindness, so that they could not find the door. The two men said to Lot, Do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here, because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy him. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you speak to us from your word, our Father. O oh God, give clarity and understanding 
challenge us, our Father, we pray in response to what you, O oh God, I ask, our Father. So that truly, O oh God, we know the grace, mercies, and the love of yours, O oh God, as our Father, you speak to our hearts and our lives and draw us in response. For we ask all this in Jesus' wonderful name. May God's wonderful people say, Amen. Amen. Will you take your seats? How many of us, church, we are broken vessels? In other words, there is something in our lives that we know that it's not, not quite right. Maybe it's a lack of joy. Maybe we hunger, anger, a bitterness. Maybe we go into a rage when things don't get right. Maybe we're impatient with people. Maybe we're demanding. Maybe we're addicted to different kinds of things, whether it be pornography or alcohol or gambling or smoking or whatever man in form of brokenness. How many of us, we are broken vessels? Can I see your hands? How many of us, we are broken vessels? Okay, I would expect every hand to be up. Why? Because if your hand is not up, you are perfect, almost like Jesus. And none of us are. Amen, isn't it? We are all broken vessels, friends. Isn't it? Including heterosexuals and homosexuals. All of us are broken people. We all need help. And hope is available in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can a good amen for that? This is an amazing thing, and this is what the good news of Jesus Christ is all about. That each and every one of us, no matter what kind of background we come from, no matter how broken we have been, friends, you and I can find hope and help in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, friends, can I say, this message is not just targeted at LGBTs, as it were. This is meant for all of us. Can I good amen for that? And it's so important to recognize this, and that's critical for us, church, as we deal and handle this sensitive subject, and as we apply this in the process to all of us, right, as a people of God like this. Now, the first thing, friends, you and I must do is really confess our prejudice. Friends, you know, we have different kinds of prejudice in our lives, and the slides will come on right now. What kind of prejudice we have? I couldn't control the slides here because of technology that has failed us this weekend, unfortunately. What are the prejudices that we have with regards to people like this from that kind of background, the LGBTs? First, friends, the first prejudice we have is to do with judgmentalism. We are just very judgmental towards people like this. We despise them. We look down upon them. We make fun of them. Church, can I say, this is totally inappropriate for the people of God and all God's people say, Totally unbecoming, friends, when we begin to be so judgmental towards people like this. Not only, friends, that sometimes we need to confess for us as Christians, there is a spirit of judgmentalism. There is also a spirit, worse still, of condemnation. We are condemnatory towards people like this. We say, you are consigned to hell. This is a terrible thing to say to anyone from that kind of background, isn't it? This is a wicked thing, really, to say. And sadly, friends, can I say, Sometimes we Christians fall into that kind of trap. And if we do, we need to repent and ask God for forgiveness. Can a good amen for that, isn't it? So important, friends, that our heart and our attitude must be right in relating to these people, and for that matter, anyone that we come across like this. That's the first thing you and I must deal with, friends. The whole era of prejudice we have against or towards people like this. But what is the picture we see about these people? Not just we're going to handle our own prejudice, but really, what's the picture we see about these people that we interact with for some of us, we come into contact with? The first picture, friends, we see about these people, they are some of the most smartest and creative people around. Really. They're some of the most wonderful people around that you and I see, isn't it? And some of us actually work with them. Some of these people could be your bosses, really. Isn't it? Even here in UMC, there are some who have told me, Pastor, my boss is someone from that kind of background. And it's really smart and sharp, really creative. And you and I can tell numbers of people who really come from that background, isn't it? Sharp, creative, and just outstanding in many ways. Person like, for example, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, has come up in the open to say he's gay, isn't it? Those are some realities, friends, right, that you and I need uh, to be challenged about. Not only are some of the most smartest and creative people around, we also see, secondly, friends, they are some of the most gracious and generous people around. Some of the most kindest and considerate people. Tender-hearted, thoughtful, helpful, big-hearted and giving towards in helping any kind of cause that is around. This is a reality. Because sometimes, unfortunately, friends, we have our own prejudice. We think that these kind of people have got horns and fangs. That's not true at all, isn't it? 
It is so important, friends, all right, for you and I to deal with the hang-ups in our life when we relate to people like this because there's some of those most wonderful people, not oftentimes the kind of caricature we have of certain people like this, that we tend to be aloof. We look down upon people like this. Talking about being very condescending towards people reminds me of this great, wonderful dinner function where a distinguished guest was invited to speak, all right? And there's great audience there in Britain. And seated on the main table is this British guy. And seated next to the British guy is a Chinese gentleman from mainland China in his Mao Zedong outfit. You know Mao Zedong outfit, okay, that kind of thing. And so the British gentleman thought he would give some lessons as to British etiquette, right, to this Chinese gentleman. And so when the food was served, okay, the starters came in, that kind of thing, he took his fork and spoon up and he told the Chinese gentleman next to him, he says, sir, this is spork, this is spoony and it's a forky. All right, the Chinese gentleman bowed his head and smiled. And then finally, right, he said to the Chinese gentleman, this is soupy. And so he had his soup and everything else at the end of it all. And finally, when the MC came and announced that tonight, we got a wonderful distinguished guest who are going to speak to all of us. And the Chinese gentleman went up to speak and he spoke flawless English, Queen's English. Couldn't believe it. When he came down, he said to the British gentleman next to him, how is my speechy? <laughs> That's a lesson of being condescending towards people like this. He said, <laughs> friends, you know, Sometimes we relate to people from that kind of background in a very condescending way, and that is totally inappropriate. And a good amen for that, isn't it? That's very, very important. Not only, really, friends, you know, you and I must confess our prejudice. You and I must understand sometimes a true picture we see of these people. But what kind of posture as Christians, therefore, we should adopt? What kind of posture? Friends, you know, the first posture you and I must adopt is a whole area of showing respect towards these people. We must be respectful of these people. Being respectful of such people does not mean we condone their practices. And it's very important. There's a difference between respecting them, honoring them, right? And not agreeing with their practices. But we can, friends, as human beings, respect one another, isn't it? Why? Because these are people whom God has created in His image. All of us are created in the image of God, and all those who agree say, Looks like some of us are not. God have mercy upon us. We are all created in God's image. It's as much as all these people like this. And therefore, anyone who is created image of God deserves to be respected. That is very important. In respecting the person, it doesn't mean we condone, we encourage the practices. Not just only friends, you know, you and I must respect people like this. More than that, we must go one step further. We must love people like this. Really. Reach out to love them. Why? Because they are people whom Jesus loves and all God's people say, isn't it? They are people whom God loves. Jesus loves everyone, isn't it? Sinner or saint or whatever else, He loves all of us, like every one of us. Even though we are broken vessels, Jesus loves us in spite of our brokenness. Amen, isn't it? In spite of whatever we are, whoever we are, He loves us just the same. And that's, those were the songs, some of the songs that we sang just now, isn't it? in spite of all that we've gone through in our life. Friends, He loves us just the same, and He wants to draw us into a dynamic living relationship with Him. Not as much as, friends, you know, the prejudices that we have that we need to deal with, the picture we see about them is really just amazing, and many, many times it shocks us, okay, about the true picture we see of these people. Not only, friends, you notice for us, our posture must be right in terms of really respecting them and loving them. What is the perspective of Scripture? And it's important for you and I to grapple with. What does the Scripture have to say about this subject? Friends, you know, firstly, I want to say this subject is not new at all. There is nothing new under the sun about this subject. Why? Because here in Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 and 21, church, let's read again, all right, this passage of Scripture together, church. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and the sin so grievous that I will go down and see what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. As we know, Sodom and Gomorrah, they, uh, these were eventually judged because of homosexuality that is at its height practiced in these two cities. And God has no choice but to step in to judge those cities. 
And friends, can I say, it has been there for thousands of years in the Bible. And so for someone to say, come on church, come on Christians who wake up with you, we are in the 21st century, what are you talking about? You're just behind time. Maybe you're even uncivilized, right? Not to be open to something like this, not to really be big-hearted about this and to begin to think that this is something inappropriate whatsoever. But church, can I say, it has been there for thousands of years. It is not something that is new altogether, something whereby the church or Christians are behind time. And that's where we get the word sodomy, isn't it? Because the word sodomy comes from the word Sodom. And these are realities that you and I need to grapple with in this 21st century. Not in church can I say that this subject is not new. The second thing about the perspective of Scripture is that you and I must know where is our authority as Christians. Because as evangelical Christians, we all appeal to a certain authority. Every one of us, we appeal to authorities in our lives, isn't it? And as therefore, the people of God, as committed evangelical Christians, our authority is the word of God and all God's people say. And that's why we find, for example, okay, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Church, let's read together this passage of Scripture together. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, it says all Scripture, not some Scripture or certain parts of Scripture. It is all Scripture. It is God-breathed and therefore is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that you and I would really be equipped well by God to do the work of God in a wonderful manner. Isn't it? And therefore, church, our authority that we appeal to is the Word of God. It is at the end, what does the Word of God has to say on a subject like this? And that's very important. Other people may appeal to other authorities, that's fine. But for God's people, Christians, and here in UMC, we appeal to the Word of the living God, isn't it? And for friends, you notice that as we appeal to the Word of the living God, we find that you and I must grapple with this whole subject, therefore, as we look at the authority of God's Word. What does God's Word have to say about us as human beings? that God, friends, has made us male or female, right? That's what you and I see in the Word of God. And so in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse 27, let's read together. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So friends, God's Word comes across clearly. It is either male or female and no in-between. That's what the Word of God says. And you and I need to be clear about it. Whilst we say that, now sometimes we know it can be a very painful thing. Sometimes we see a situation whereby a person that has been born may look quite different from the norm, as it were. It is not uncommon when you talk to pediatricians to tell you sometimes, unfortunately, a baby is born with two sexual organs, a male and a female. It's a painful thing. It's a difficult thing. But those things are real. It is also in God's creation around, for example, not uncommon to see a lizard being born with two heads or a snake with two heads. How many of us have seen something like this? How many of us have? I have myself seen a snake with two heads or sometimes a cow with five legs. How many of us have seen that? Yes, several hands, isn't it? Now these are corruptions of God's wonderful creation because we're living in a fallen world and in a fallen world, unfortunately, we find that there are things that happen that are out of the norm, isn't it? It is a sad thing. But those are realities that we are faced with because we are living in a world that is broken, in a world that is fallen. But this is not God's norm in His creation like this. And that's the reason why, friends, right, I've been told, for example, there is a person right, who's got a different kind of chromosome composition. Now, for all of us, male or female, our chromosome, if we're a female, is a double X. If it's a male, it's an X and Y, and all those will agree, say. Okay, some of us not quite sure. We need to pray for you. If a female is a double X, it's an XX. If a male is an XY, that's a norm. Okay? 
But if someone here in Malaysia has been born with XXY, difficult and painful to have to grapple and wrestle with that, you know. But I would say these kind of things do happen, unfortunately, because we're living in a broken world. And those are realities we struggle with, isn't it? For example, a child that is born is an albino, okay, isn't it? Totally without pigment whatsoever. And look at a child, you feel so sorry. But friends, can I say, exceptions should not be used to argue for the norm. Can I repeat? Exceptions should not be used to argue for the norm. That because they are there, therefore, it's a normal thing. Therefore, it is not a normal thing. All right? These are exceptions. These are accidents, as it were, of creations of God and history like this, unfortunately, that we have to deal and handle because we're living in a broken world. As much as, friends, a perspective of Scripture is one whereby as we deal with a subject like this, you and I must recognize the, our authority, we appeal to it, whereby the Word of God says we are made male or female. In fact, friends, can I say this? In textbooks in Taiwan, my dear brother, a very highly respected, committed Christian leader in Taiwan tells me, Pastor Daniel, in our Taiwan textbooks in schools, the kids are taught there are seven sexes. I don't know how they end up with that. But imagine, at a young age, they've been taught like this, what is going to happen in a process like this, isn't it? And that's the reason why, church, you and I got to be clear, as Christians, as God's people, as people committed to the Word of God, what the Word of God says, isn't it? That the Bible tells us God made us male or female. As much as it is the case, what does the Bible, therefore, have to say about a subject like this? What is the perspective of Scripture, the comments of Scripture about this subject? Let's look at Romans chapter 1, right, verses 26 and 27, okay? The Bible says just like this. Let's go back to, uh, right, to that uh, before that, right? The Bible have got clear comments about these kinds of practices. Now, I'm just quoting one passage of Scripture. There are a few other passages actually that talks about it, but just one passage is good enough. And so Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 20, 27, church, let's read together. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even the women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. And so, church, we find it here. Scripture is quite clear about what it says in comments, okay, on a subject like this, isn't it? And that's the reason why, friends, you know, for you and I as God's people, we have to be clear about what the Word of God has to say and not what the world has to say and not what even a court has to say. And this is important. It is not what social science has to say. It is what the Word of God has to say and all God's people say, isn't it? And it's important for you and I to understand something like this. Now, the thing is that sometimes we may ask the question, how come these people become like that? What happened? I want to make three suggestions. I want to say three things, although there are other reasons that can result about these people becoming like that. Not the only reasons, but three I want to propose here this morning for us. The first reason is to do with family dynamics. Sometimes we find that the family dynamics is wrong. There's a dysfunction in a family. Maybe it's because of an absentee or a very, very harsh father. Or it could be the other way around, or that of a mother. And sometimes because of this dysfunction in a family dynamics, it has unfortunately created a situation whereby the child grows up with a certain kind of tendency in a process. And sometimes, if not guided properly, they end up become people who will practice things like this. Friends, those are realities that is happening all over the world. But friends, can I add on by saying, it does not mean because there is poor or bad family dynamics, everyone will end up like this. This is not the case, church, can I say? Because I know of some wonderful single parents who have brought out the kids well, in sight of the fact, for example, right, that person don't have a father figure from very young or a mother figure from very young. And these have come out extremely, extremely well, isn't it? So, friends, can I say, family dynamics is not just one whereby everyone will end up like this when there's a dysfunction in the family. Not true at all. I think, for example, of this dear friend of mine, one of the most outstanding Christian leaders in the world, 
And what happens is, all right, it is only recently I found out, we've known each other for many, many years now. It is only recently I found out that uh, he was uh, birthed from a Jewish father whom he has never met all these years. And the mother was a bar girl. And they be bumped from house to house, home to home, all right? Just thrown around just like this because the mother has to work in the bar again, again, different places, different cities in the United States. And in spite of that kind of background, friends, he turned out to be one of the most outstanding Christian leaders, gracious and kind and thoughtful and considerate, and persevering and believing God for great breakthroughs. What an amazing man, and some of us know him. He has been here with us before, Reverend Dr. Greg Livingston, who is now based in the UK, although American, and founded this great organization, right called Frontiers, has touched thousands and thousands of people, especially across the Muslim world. In spite of that seriously unhealthy and wrong family dynamics, in God's mercies and grace, many of these people have come up well. And that's why I want to say there are some single parents here. I want to appreciate you and commend you for the hard work you put in in raising your kids and doing your very best. And we want to really thank God for you and continue to pray for you and all God's people say, Listen, will you give a big, wonderful clap offering to Jesus for this, this wonderful people? I know it's been hard and difficult. In fact, just yesterday itself, I performed a marriage. And the bride herself lost her father as a young little girl. 22 years ago, brought up single-handedly by the mother. Four kids brought up by the mother just like this. And what an outstanding girl she's become today as a lawyer. And what a joy, what a privilege it is to be able to perform the wedding that together with everyone present. And what a, it was a huge privilege for me as I reflect on it because why I did the wedding for the bridegroom's parents. And now I did the wedding for him. Okay, and the bride, this is over 30 years later. Isn't it? Thank God. You and I still survive 30 years later. Hello, isn't it? This is God's grace and God's mercies and love for all of us. But friends, you know, family dynamics, sometimes when there's a dysfunction, unfortunately resulted in something like this. There's a second reason for it. And the sec second reason is one of the environment. The environment that we are with, that we mix with, it can sometimes wear out, okay, our standards, our principles, our defenses, and slowly, slowly find that we begin to see that there's nothing wrong at all. What's the problem? Uh, these people are perfectly healthy, normal people, all right? And we begin, okay, to slowly, if we're not careful, begin to swing and sway in the process in terms of our own position and stand or with regards to scripture like this. And those are some realities. People who have done research, gone and done, do research in this area, have ended up becoming one end up becoming a practice in the process of those who don't, end up become activists for them. Now, we say there's nothing wrong with being activists for them, but what we need to be clear about is, friends, what the Word of God has to tell us about this, isn't it? And so sometimes in the environment we are in, we find that we, if we're not careful, right, we can swing and sway in the process. Not only, friends, sometimes the reason for such a thing happening is not only about family dynamics, it's not only about the environment, Thirdly, friends, we find as we wrestle with something like this, it could be to do with inducements, all right? Inducements that a person experience. I know of men, for example, who induce young little boys and violate them sexually and trying to move them in that direction in the process. It is a painful thing, it's a sad thing. But those things are real, friends, can I say? And all these three reasons that I've given, there are examples that has happened here in Malaysia I'm talking about. So it's not kind of airy-fairy thing that I'm talking. These are realities that is happening even in Malaysian society. In fact, I would say in societies across the world. You and I, as we grapple with something like this, friends, Quite often we find that people from that background would posit certain positions, right? They would try to posit and say what could be, right? The positions that they adopt with regards to something like this. They would say, friends, to many, many people that this is just an alternative lifestyle. Just an alternative lifestyle. You have a heterosexual lifestyle. I have my homosexual lifestyle. 
What's the problem? Let us learn to live and let live together, isn't it? That's the first argument. Like this, just an alternative. The second thing that is posited, we find it for these people is it is in our genes. We are born like that. As far as the literature that I read, and all that I have read, so far I have not come across in any literature that it says it is in the genes. Those are some realities. All right. But it's the third and final one. The third and final one that these people argue is this is to do with human rights. It is your right to practice what you like. It is my right to practice what I like. You make your choice. I make my choice. And you should not deny me my choice. Of course, we don't argue with that. That's true, isn't it? Every one of us has the right to practice in a way that he or she likes, isn't it? And it's it's a choice we all make in life, and that's true. We we accept that, and that's very very important because why we should not penalize people, especially when they don't agree with our position. We should honor and respect them. Amen, isn't it? I think that's important for you and I because it will be terrible for Christians to become oppressive, to become right, someone who will really go out to, to really abuse them, all right, in a manner. We should respect them, as I said, we should respect them, we should honor them, we should love them. That's what we should come across to people like this, and it's very, very important because I pray by God's grace, none of us in any position whatsoever become one that really abuses all right, of these people like this. They will victimize these people, and that's inappropriate as a people of God. There are two scenarios that we see, friends, as we deal with all right, a subject like this. And you and I are going to make clear about these two scenarios that we see. The first scenario is there is that whole area of human attraction, tendency, or orientation. There's a whole area of human attraction, or homosexual attraction, or orientation, or tendency. That sometimes we find a man can be attracted to another man uh, in a very, very special manner whereby there's deep feelings and emotions involved. Sometimes that happens. And friends, can I say, having this kind of attraction, tendency, and orientation is not sin. Some people want to press me and say, Pastor, that's sin. I want to say that's not sin, having that kind of attraction, orientation, or tendency. It is like us. Heterosexuals and I trust most of us are heterosexuals and all those agree say. Okay. It is like us heterosexuals, even though we are married, sometimes, occasionally, once in a while, a long, long time, <laughs> we are attracted to another woman who is not our wife. God or not? Don't put up your hands. <laughs> if God just not, okay? Isn't it? Yeah. My good friend John Smith says, even Uncle John Stott also says this when he was alive. Some of these Asian girls are so pretty and beautiful. How can you not be attracted towards them? Thank God for Asian ladies. But friends, it's normal, it's natural to be attracted, isn't it? When you see a thing of beauty, so I want to say, friends, attraction is not sin, although it is inappropriate. And all those who agree say, and all the men say, amen. not very convincing, amen. And all the men say, amen. all right, thank you, John. Okay, others are going to deal with you, really. It is inappropriate, all right? It is unnatural to have that kind of attraction to another woman or to your married man to another woman who is not your wife. It is totally inappropriate to do that, although it's not sin. It becomes sin in the outworking into actions, amen, isn't it? When it's worked out in terms of actions, it's wrong. And so, friends, when we're attractions like this, we've got to deal with it. We've got to acknowledge it, and it's very important. We'll come to it at the end of it all. And so, church, can I say, even for these people, like having a homosexual attraction, a tendency, or orientation doesn't make it sin, all right? It just needs some help along in a process like this. So there's a whole way of homosexual attraction, tendency, orientation. This is the second thing, which is due now with homosexual practices. And we all know that's wrong. That's sin that the Bible tells us very clearly about. And we've got to acknowledge and accept that. 
Because if you say that's not wrong as well, that's not sin, then we've got a problem because it's inconsistent with what the Word of God says to all of us, isn't it? Those are two scenarios that we see okay, around us like this. The final thing, church, is therefore, what is our Christian response? What is our response in the light of the things that I have said for all of us? The first response, I think it is so important for us to differentiate between the person and the practices. To differentiate between the person and the practices. It's the practice of it that makes it wrong. And therefore, sometimes we, we hear this, it might be too much of a cliche nowadays. We love the sinner, but we hate the sin. Amen, isn't it? We love the sinner, whoever they are. We love other people, whatever background. We love one another, okay? But we hate the sin. We hate the wrong. We hate the compromise. And that's important for you and I to deal with, to handle, isn't it? Right? In practices that are wrong, as Christians, there is a need to take a stand and a position about, isn't it? It can be also, for example, a married man committing adultery with another woman. Isn't it? We need to deal with that as well. It could also be a man and a woman, both not married, living in the same house together, just the two of them, and that's all. That is equally wrong. In fact, DMC has a strong position about this many, many years ago. Right? When I look to our membership weekend, um, our membership form, or people applying for membership here of DMC, a couple, when I look through the form, I notice they have the same ad address. Not an issue, not a problem. But the marital status, I notice both of them put down single. Single. Same address. I thought they are married. They've been coming to the church together for quite a fair bit of time. I had to pull them in and sit down and talk with them and say to them, are you married? No, pastor, we are not. How come same address? Pastor, cheaper to live two together. Share same food, same transport, same everything. All right, so much cheaper. I say, friends, this is just doing things out of convenience, not doing things out of commitment. Okay, I said to them, one of you got to move out. Reluctantly, they went off. A week later, I said, I want to see you. They came back, wanting to try to persuade me as to why it is unreasonable for one of us to move out. But on the way, as they came in, God spoke to them. And when they see me, Pastor, Pastor we we're both convinced, got to move out, got to move out, got to move out. Church, can I say, we're here to help one another. We're here to help one another to do right and to walk right because how many of us want to be blessed by God? Can I see hands? How many of us want to be blessed by God? Surely all of us want to be blessed by God. Isn't it? We all want to be blessed by God. And we want to be blessed by God, church. We want to walk right before God. Isn't it? We want to walk consistent with the Word of God. And that's very, very important. And as I said, you know, if this young man comes along to you, a fine, wonderful lady, and she can, he cannot wait anymore, and you know what, in that relationship you start, he cannot wait anymore, and he wants to have sex with you, you know what, young ladies, drop him like a hot potato. And if a young lady comes along and have a wonderful relationship with you, young man, and she cannot wait anymore, and she wants to have sex with you, drop her at a, as a hot pancake. <laughs> Amen, isn't it? All right, that's important. Because we don't want to compromise our character. We don't want to compromise our walk and the commitment to God, isn't it? That's so critical for us in order to make sure, friends, when we walk right with God, we enjoy the grace of God, the blessings of God, isn't it? Very, very important for all of us to recognize. True love waits. True love waits. If that person loves you honestly, sincerely, that person can wait should wait and must wait. If he cannot wait, just drop him. Really. Because he's more concerned about satisfying himself than concerned about what is best for both of us. And you come across a man like this. Church, can I say, ladies, can I say, it's not worth it. Because if he can take advantage of you even before you're married, see what's going to happen after marriage, isn't it? It's important, friends, to draw certain boundaries and guidelines for one another to live consistently with God so that as we honour God, friends, you know, God's grace will be poured upon all of us when we enjoy His unusual favour upon us all, isn't it? So that's the first thing, church. Differentiate between the person and the practices. Secondly, friends, 
we must relate to them as friends. Very important for all of us, isn't it? That these are friends of ours. These are people whom God has created, whom Jesus loves, and we must do the same as well. Treat them, right, as friends. Love them. Relate to them in a manner whereby it is consistent with what God wants us to do as a people of God like this, isn't it? Not reject them, not turn away from them, not to have nothing to do with them, especially in, if they are within your circle of friendship, relationship, or especially if you're in the circle of work environment. It's very important for all of us to be extend the love of Jesus in a wonderful manner like this, isn't it, for us all. But there's a third and final response. The third and final response is to reach out to them, ready to reach out to them, all right? Because why? God loves them as much as He loves all of us. In other words, friends, you know, some of us may feel called, may feel called to be involved in a ministry like this. That you want to give yourself and your time aside to really be involved in something like this, in reaching out to bring hope and help and healing to these people. And church, can I say, if some of us do feel called like this, there are three important things that you must do. The first thing is never going alone, always going as a team. Because you need that support and accountability together. And that's very, very important. The second thing is that you need intercessors. You need people to be praying for you and continue to uphold, intercede for you. And that's very important it's because you're stepping into a territory by being engaged in spiritual warfare as in any other ministry as well. It's in, and particularly in this, you need intercessors to be praying. Why? Because you're in, you must know for a long haul, isn't it? It is really a long-haul ministry in something like this that right, people who may feel called want to go into. But there's a third and final thing, which is, friends, to be accountable to the church leadership as well. That in holding yourself accountable, the church leadership wants to walk with you as well in that journey so that we pray by God's grace there will be breakthroughs that will take place, isn't it? All right? There will really be things that will turn around in a wonderful, wonderful manner like this. Finally then, as we do something like this, what should it be for all of us? Not just for these people, but for every one of us to experience healing and wholeness. Friends, if we want to do that, and for these people who want to experience that, the first thing that a person needs to do is to recognize that we've got a problem or a challenge. We've got to recognize we've got a problem or a challenge in this area or whatever area. You see, it starts with recognizing a problem. Because if there is no recognition of a problem, nobody can help us, isn't it? For example, if you don't recognize that you're involved in an adulterous relationship, no one can help you, isn't it? You've got to recognize it is wrong so that people can step in and help you along and really help you to have experience breakthrough. So likewise, whatever background we come from, and if we are struggling in this area, recognize it's an issue, recognize it is inconsistent with God's word. If a person says, no, there's nothing wrong, I'm okay. No one can help, really, you know. That's the first thing. Not only we recognize that we've got a problem or a challenge. Secondly, friends, there is need for repentance. We need to repent from it. We need to acknowledge it is wrong and turn away from it. Sin. And so, if one is in a gay relationship, and a gay marriage. We've got to recognize it is inconsistent with God's word to repent from it. In fact, I would say, church, it shouldn't be called a gay marriage. Because marriage, as defined in Scripture, is very clear. It's between a man and a woman. And so, therefore, from my perspective and UMC's perspective, it is not a gay marriage. It is a gay union. Because a marriage has a clear connotation as defined in scripture, which is between a man and a woman. And so therefore, friends, not only we're going to recognize that we're going to issue a challenge or a problem, we're going to repent from it. Thirdly, friends, can I say, we've got to reject it. Not just repent and turn away from it. We've got to reject it completely, say no and no more completely about it, isn't it? It could be, for example, if you're involved in a relationship with another woman who is not your wife, 
as you recognize a problem, as you repent from it. You must reject it totally and completely in what manner? For example, that lady's phone number is on your handphone. Delete it as soon as possible and have nothing to do with it. Hello? You hear what I'm saying? If it's on computer, delete it and have nothing to do with it. And if you cannot delete it, throw away it. And if you cannot delete from a handphone, give it to me. I know what to do with it. <laughs> Isn't it? Because never entertain things like this. Because why? The guy calls you, okay? And your, your heart slowly, slowly, your heart warmed out. Or the lady calls you, your heart begins to fire up again, that kind of thing. Emotions and everything else, passion kicks in. And before you realize it, because of the soul tie that has been there early on, it clicks on again. It locks you in. And you find it so hard. Church, can I say, delete it two, three, four times, whatever. It's an iPhone 6, throw away. <laughs> Isn't it? Because it's become a problem for us. If it's become a problem, deal with it, friends, strongly, firmly, and harshly. For our sake, for the Lord's sake, for God's people's sake, and all God's people's sake. Very important for all of us, isn't it? Whether we are homosexual, heterosexual, whatever, it does not matter. As I say, this is meant for every one of us, isn't it? If you've got a problem of addiction, for example, addiction to pornography, you've got to deal with it very, very strongly, isn't it? Not only we find you've got to recognize you've got a problem, okay, and also repent from it, but reject it. Delete everything from your computer and you find it is almost impossible because you've got so much rubbish and so much trash inside. Throw away your computer. Don't even auction it. Hello? Isn't it? That's become not just not helpful, that's become harmful for us. Very important, church, you know, for us to face hate on when there are problems in our lives because if we don't deal with it, friends, you know, there will never be breakthrough. And fourth and finally, friends, receive healing and wholeness in the process. God wants to bring breakthrough for all our lives. He wants to bring change and transformation. But change and transformation can only come when we recognize we've got a problem, repent from it, reject it, and then finally receive so that there will be real restoration in our lives. And real, isn't it? So that, friends, God will impress us in a process of bringing healing and wholeness for all of us. That is critical for us, church, you know. For you and I here in DMC to acknowledge and recognize that. And so therefore, friends, can I say this morning, God is speaking and challenging all of us about healing and wholeness. It is not just, as I said earlier on at the start, it is, this message is not just meant for those who struggle with these issues about LGBTs. It is an issue for every one of us, church. Whatever our hang-ups and our problems, whatever, friends, our brokenness in life, God wants to intervene, break through, touch us and heal and restore us. If it's addiction to pornography, to smoking, to gambling, to drinking, if it is one whereby we have been abusive and exploitative, we've been unjust and unfair, if it is one where we harbor anger, bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, if it is one whereby we feel always better than everyone else, those things are equally bad. And when we're demanding, when we're pushy, when we drive into Dream Center and push for our way and that we must have a parking spot and that kind of thing. We all recognize we are short in so many ways, even in Dream Center with regards to parking spot, isn't it? But when we become demanding and, and that kind of thing, it becomes unhelpful because this is not a spirit of UMC, friends. Because spirit of UMC is humility, is submission, is teachability, is giving way to one another, isn't it? It is really being big-hearted, willing to be taught, to be corrected if necessary. Why? Because we are growing community towards a process of healing and wholeness. Can you good amen for that? That's what God wants to do in all our hearts and our lives. Shall we pray? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to first extend an invitation for those of us here this morning who have not trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Some people, maybe you'll come not knowing what is going to happen and to hear a message like this. Others of us, maybe you come on an invitation of a friend or relative. But I want to say, my friend, if you're here, 
I want to tell you that God loves you. You are here not just by accident or by the invitation of a friend or relative. You are here because God loves you. You are special and precious. And that if you've never known Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, my friend, can I urge you encounter Christ in a wonderful way. Make today the greatest of all days. That this decision you make will be a defining moment of life. It has happened to many of us, including myself, in making decisions to open our hearts to Jesus. Life has never been the same, and it's just amazing and wonderful and the right of our life ever since. And so, my friend, you will never open a heart to Jesus, never taking the personal step to invite Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior. I want to extend this invitation to you with heads bowed and eyes closed. After us, at a count of three, at a count of three, wherever you're seated with heads bowed and eyes closed, either downstairs or up in the gallery, would you raise up your hand? Because in raising by your hand, it's an indication both to me and to God that you would like to invite Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior. So are you ready at a count of three, wherever you are, downstairs or up in the gallery? You would raise up your hand high so I can see your hand. I want to pray for you. Are you ready? One, two, and three. Is anyone here? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, downstairs first. Anyone else? Anybody else? What about up in the gallery? Would you raise up a hand? Up in the gallery. Anyone else up in the gallery? Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. Another one. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Would you raise high up? I can see your hand. Would I pray for you? Anybody else? Those who put up their hands, can you say after me this prayer? And church, can I ask you to join in this prayer? In this prayer, is make a commitment to Christ to acknowledge that we are sinners, to believe Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins, to ask Him to forgive us of our sins and invite Jesus into our life as Lord and Savior. When we pray that prayer, God in His mercies and grace comes and breaks through in our lives and draws us to faith in Him in a wonderful manner. So those who put our hands, will you say this prayer after me? And church, will you join in to encourage these, our new brothers and sisters? Say after me with you, Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for your love for me. Lord Jesus, I want to acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Right now, I invite you to come into my life to be my Lord and my Savior. Take control of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your power to live as a Christian, as a child of yours from today onwards. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, seal it in the hearts of those who pray this prayer sincerely. You know every one of these, O oh God. And bring to pass, Father, us, or in Jesus' name, new life, O oh God, that lead them on to grow in you, to know you. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, O oh God, and in a wonderful manner to continue, O oh God, on the journey of faith and be blessed by you in a, in a great and mighty manner. So commit these precious ones to you, Father, we ask. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Shall we stand to sing this closing song as we stand? Those who put up their hands up to us, I want to invite you to come right to the front. Whether downstairs, up in the gallery, I see several hands up in the gallery. Will you come right to the front? We want to pray for you, give some uh, literature, some materials to help you. All right, just very, very quickly, we pray for you, give us some literature. All right, for those who put up their hands to accept Christ as Lord and Savior, even if not put up your hands, but you pray this prayer sincerely for the first time in your life, would you come to the front where I'm standing as well? We're going to help you, right? Because you'll come new babes as if were in Christ. We're going to help you on a journey of faith. But church, I believe this message, as I said, is meant for all of us. It's meant for every one of us. Why? Because we're all broken vessels. We all need healing and wholeness. So whatever brokenness in our lives, whatever that is wrong, church, will you come and pray for you? Addictions we struggle with, orientation that's inappropriate, not right at all. Whatever form of op or, uh, orientation we may have, church, would you come? Whatever form of attraction that you know that it's not right, would you come as well? Whatever man and form, friends, of really enslavement you experience, you're not experiencing freedom whatsoever, would you come as well and pray for you, church? We're going to pray for real breakthroughs and up in the gallery, would you come and staircases on both sides to the frontier as well? We're going to pray for you, church, because there's an amazing breakthroughs right in frontier. 
again and again people encounter God and His grace and His power here, friends. So will you come, just as many, whatever you wrestle, struggle with, whatever your hang-ups, whatever your hurts, wounds and pains, whatever it may be, church, you'll come, all right? And some of us, maybe we need to rededicate our lives anew and afresh to Christ. To say, Lord, I want to turn away from the past. I want to recommit my life anew and afresh to you. I want to be serious with you. So whatever it is, church, will you come as we sing this closing song? Just step up from the seats, will you come, church? Just come with you as quickly as possible. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Those of your friends, will you come? We're going to pray for you. Just come right to the front. Yes, God wants to do something in our lives. He wants to bring breakthrough. Thank you, Lord. Even when Thank you, Lord. Let's just come and receive the grace of God, church. Right, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that God will intervene and bring release and breakthrough. That God will just uh, do a wonderful touch, okay, in our hearts, in our lives, in a powerful man. Just keep on coming with the church. We're going to pray for you. some of us we wrestle with relationships the sense that there is at least one person here you are in a relationship that you know does not honor God would you come we're gonna pray for you as well friends we're gonna pray to God to intervene and bring a breakthrough and it you find it hard to break that relationship that you know is wrong would you come we're gonna pray for you for God to give you strength and courage to do so it could also be a business venture that you know is going really going in the wrong manner. Would you come? We're gonna pray for you as well. In a sense, some of us we are not experiencing a real change and transformation as we desire and want to honor God. Would you come? We're gonna pray for you. What are men and former struggles, addictions you have? You come, church. We're gonna pray for you. Is it okay? Some of us not well. We're gonna pray for God's power to heal. We've seen amazing miracles here, church. So will you come? As the worship team leads us to a last time, church. Will you come? Just as many. Come, would you quickly? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You go before me. Thank you, Lord. You shield my way. If you pray the sinner's prayer, you'll come with a pray for you, church. Maybe recommitment, rededication, whatever maybe you just come, we pray for you. Come to the cross. Yes, at the cross of Christ, church. Yes, the cross of Christ, friends. That is bring breakthrough. As I close in prayer, you can still come. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray that God will just can you minister to us in a wonderful manner. Church, would you just reach out your hand? Raise up a hand to God. I want to pray for all of us for healing and wholeness to us. Whatever man and form of brokenness we may have, just come before God as we raise up our hands to Him. Father, we come before you, O oh God. We are conscious that we're coming before a God who is altogether holy. We come acknowledging, Father, our own brokenness in our lives. That we are all broken vessels in a process, O oh God, of being restored to wholeness. Thank you that you're merciful towards every one of us. That you're a God who never wants to condemn us, but a God who wants to forgive and restore us. And Lord, I pray for all of us, Father, 
in whatever manner and form, O oh God, our Father of our brokenness. Lord, I pray that you intervene, break through, and touch every one of us, O oh God, I pray, Father, that in Jesus' name I bind and I loosen, O oh God, every hindrance, obstruction, O oh God, and difficulty in our life. That we will deal with it, Father, I pray. That, Lord, for those of us, Father, who wrestle, O oh God, with challenges and problems and strongholds in our lives, that we will recognize this as a problem, that we will repent from it, O oh God, that we will reject our Father, turn away from it totally, completely, that we receive from you in a process, oh God, healing and wholeness, Father, I pray. Help each and every one of us to come to a place, our Father, of wholeness in the Lord Jesus Christ, so that we become great, wonderful disciples for you, so that we make a difference in this world, so that our lives will touch many lives and see, Father, change and transformation society taking place, Lord. Help us all, Father, I pray. Help us all, Lord. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Give a wonderful clap offering to Jesus. Amen. Amen.